those of y'all who've been around for a hot little minute, y'all know every week I put up a link for a quiz. Give you guys like a whole week to do it. I'll tell you what videos to go watch in the pinned comments associated with that. And so this week's quiz was on IT fundamentals, sections 1.5 and 1.6. And this was discussing uh, units of measure and the troubleshooting methodology. All right. So the first question is, which of the following is equal to 1,024 bytes? Would this be a gigabyte, a bit, kilobyte, or megabyte? So which of these is equal to 1,024 bytes? And the correct answer would be, this would be a kilobyte. A kilobyte is equal to 1,024 bytes. We all understand what a byte is. A byte is, it's one byte is equal to eight bits at the end of the day. And so instead of us having to worry about how many bits are in it, we just deal with bytes and 1,024 bytes will get you one kilobyte. That's what it'll get you. All right, next question. Choose the largest unit of measure from the following list. So would this be megabyte, terabyte, gigabyte, or petabyte? So which one of these is the largest unit of measure? And the correct answer would be, this would be a petabyte. And a petabyte is 1,024 terabytes. So it goes megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, then petabyte. That's what the correct order would be. Clock speed. This measures which of the following. Is it data transfer rates, memory through, throughput, device throughput, or processor cycles per second? All right, clock speed measures what? Correct answer would be, this would be processing, processor cycles per second. That's what clock speed. So you guys go buy a computer and they're talking about clock speeds are normally measured in megahertz, gigahertz, or whatever the case may be. They're talking about how fast can the processor, your CPU and or your GPU, how fast can they process ones and zeros? And most computers today, they're measured in gigahertz because they can calculate billions of instructions per second. Most computers today, or most modern computers, I should say. You're comparing two photos. One's a JPEG and one is a CR2 RAW file. The pictures are the same resolution. Which of the following is a correct statement about these photos? Would it be the JPEG photo uses more disk space than the CR2 file? The CR2 file uses more disk space than the JPEG file. Both files use the same amount of disk space because they are the same resolution or the CR2 file was shot with a smartphone. So you got a JPEG file and a raw file photo. Which one is going to take up more space? If you guys know anything about photography, you know automatically that the raw file is going to take up more space. So the CR2 raw file. So if you guys don't know what a raw file is, here's the best example that I heard because I used to be in the photography once upon a time. So just imagine that a raw file is you in the kitchen and you're whipping up all the ingredients to make a meal from scratch. You're making spaghetti. You went and bought your noodles, your tomatoes, your, your hamburger meat. You're preparing the entire meal from scratch so that you can have a nice plate of spaghetti to eat later on. A JPEG would be the equivalent of you going to the supermarket and going to get spaghetti that's already pre-prepared. Like, um, I can't think of a spaghetti name, but you go into the freezer and you pull out the little spaghetti and all you got to do is just pop it in the oven for like 30, 40 minutes and then it'll it'll bake and it'll be ready for you to eat. That's what a JPEG is like when in comparison to a raw file. A raw file is just all the raw elements that come in there and being that they're raw elements, um, they're going to take up a lot. One image in a raw file is going to take up a lot of space on a hard drive compared to a JPEG. A JPEG takes all that information from the raw. When it's converted into a JPEG, if you got to set up like that in your camera, it basically pre-processes the image or the pixels. So it'll keep a couple pixels here, throw a couple pixels out, but the image has already been pre-prepared for you. Kind of like you going into that supermarket and getting that spaghetti that's already been pre-prepared that you just got to pop into the oven and heat up for like 30 minutes as opposed to you making the meal from scratch. A processor clock cycle consists of which of the following? It has rising and falling edges of a pulse. It has space between each pulse. It has a pulse and a rest or two pulses and a space between the pulses. But a processor clock cycle consists of which of the following? It'll be a pulse and a rest. So here is a typical digital signal right here for a clock cycle. You got your pulse and then you got your rest. You got your pulse and then you got your rest. It's basically all this is saying right here. The up and down motion. That's, that's all that it's really talking about. Which of the following components uses TCP IP configuration uh, settings? Would this be a network adapter, 
display storage or RAM. So which one of these uses TCP IP configuration settings? TCP IP stands for transmission control protocol, internet protocol. Basically, this is just basically how you communicate over the internet. So which one of these uses those settings? That will be a network adapter, a network adapter or a NIC card. Basically, this is what allows for you to get access to the internet, for you to move your ones and zeros to the wire and for your ones and zeros from the internet to come back in into your computer. So you can look at your ones and zeros in the form of a website or whatever it is that you're doing. That is what the uh, network adapter is, all right? How can you capture a BIOS UEFI firmware setup? Choose the correct method. You can press the uh, print screen key. You can use a screen sniping program, snipping program. You can use a smartphone's camera or you can use the Alt plus C keys. So you're looking at your BIOS. Your BIOS, your basic input output system. UEFI stands for what is it? Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. But basically, this is the computer system under the operating system, right? The, the most basic layer of what makes your computer come to life, where you can set boot orders and go in there and do some other crazy stuff, right? But let's just say you got your BIOS or UEFI up, up on there and you want to save the settings for what you see in case you go in there and change something later. You can come back and look at it and make changes later on. Well, what's the easiest way to do this, right? Well, the easiest way to do this would be to whip out your smartphone and take a picture of it. That is literally the easiest way to do this. You don't have to do no print screen and all this other crap because the sniping program you're gonna have to be in the actual operating system to actually use the sniping program just pull out your phone man so the whole point of this question really is to try to get you guys to think of what they call the kiss method keep it simple stupid that's what we used to say in the army and in other industries they call it keep it simple simple matter of fact i was just in an artificial intelligence conference a couple days ago and somebody made mention of the kiss acronym and it was like well we call it keep it simple simple i was like well when i was in the army we call it keep it simple stupid the whole point of this question is, is just to get you to think if you're a tech out there trying to fix some, somebody's computer, whatever the case may be, you know, what's the easiest thing you can do to try to resolve this problem of you trying to record the settings? Pull out that phone and take a picture of the dog on screen, man. <laughs> That's all you got to do. You are applying the troubleshooting methodology steps in order to fix a user's laser printer that will not print. While establishing a theory of probable cause, what should you do first? Duplicate the problem? Question the obvious? Change the toner cartridge or apply multiple problems? Problems, approach multiple problems individually. You're applying the troubleshooting methodology steps in order to fix a user's laser printer that will not work while establishing a theory of probable cause. What should you do first? So you're trying to figure out what's wrong with this thing is what they're asking you. You should question the obvious. And so basically what that means is you're trying to figure out, you go, somebody calls you, oh, my printer's not working. All right. Before you get down there, and you start tearing the printer apart, ripping wires out and all this stuff, question the obvious. Check to see if this thing is plugged in. That's questioning the obvious. Check to see if it's a network printer. Check to see if this thing is, is online or check to see if their computer has been networked to connect to that printer or if it's a computer that plugs directly, a printer that plugs directly into their computer. Check to see if the cable is plugged in. Check to see if the cable is damaged because here's the thing, guys, when you guys go out there, especially those of you who will be starting off doing like tier one type of work, Work, tier one, tier two type of stuff. You're going around there fixing people's computers. Oftentimes, it's going to be some extremely simple crap. Like somebody didn't plug something in. Somebody kicked the wire out and now their monitors are all black and they can't figure out why their monitor. I mean, look, this has happened to me a thousand million times. I remember when I was in the military, there's one particular instance. I think I was in Afghanistan. This is back in like 2010. And a full bird colonel, it was either a colonel or a lieutenant colonel, but anyway, I can't remember who, but they had called the help desk that I was in charge of. It was like, oh, we can't fix it. So I sent my little soldier over there and I went with my soldier because he was like a, he was like an E2 or something at the time or whatever. He was, anyway, he was a low ranking guy. So we go over to the colonel's office. Colonel's in there like throwing his hissy fit for legit reasons because, you know, he needs his computers to do what he has to do because we're in an active war zone. So we get over to the computer and I just look around and I discovered that he kicked the power cord out. And so I, I literally just plugged the power cord back in and boom, the computer came back to life. And he was looking at me like I'm a genius. And I'm looking at him like, yes, I am. Cause I just plugged your power cord back in. But I'm saying all this to say, this is the type of stuff that you're going to encounter. So before you start getting all super technical and wanting to show the world how super smart you are in IT, just question the obvious. Like what did this person potentially do? Do they have this thing plugged in? Did they kick the power cord? Is the power plugged in? Cause I'm willing to bet that's more than likely what's going to be, that's going to solve like probably 90% of your problems. It's simple stuff like that that happens over and over again.